And so like, what is in the third era? Like, I get that we, we have this thing, this duality. And on some level, it's like, it's always been there, right? Like, it's just yeah. that the, the dynamic is a little bit different because the, the urgency um, changes. But like, yeah. over this period where we have the, the, I guess, the enjoying the payoffs of this emancipatory um, victories in the 60s and leading up to the 60s, we also have a slow, almost like the frog doesn't realize it's being boiled in terms yeah. of like what's happening with uh, income, you know, really a lack of democracy economically, uh, yeah. you know, and where, so what the, the third period is marked by, by what these like uh, emancipatory movements that deal with in what realm, I guess. Yeah, I would say it's marked by this idea of abolition democracy, especially in the realm of criminal justice and the criminal legal system. But the way in which the criminal legal system serves as a gateway to panoramic systems of oppression. And that's what Black Lives Matter, but not just Black Lives Matter, March for Our Lives, the Women's March, um, the folks who are marching for DACA and DAPA and the Dreamers, all right. of them, you know, uh, you know, people who are fighting for queer and trans folks. People who are, you know, I'm connected with with uh, uh, you know folks who are who are part of synagogues here in Austin and and ADL and folks who are really against hate and hate speech and hate you know violence online. So so folks who are against anti-Semitism. So all of that gets to me converged during this period of the Third Reconstruction, where people are fighting for abolition, democracy in my mind, both the abolishment of systems of punishment. And then the idea of a redistributive justice that Dr. King talked about to invest in systems that allow all of us to flourish, right? Now, we haven't gotten the same kind of legislative necessarily victories as the second reconstruction, but I would argue that during the third reconstruction, without that social movement from 2020, you wouldn't have Biden elected. And Biden is certainly a reconstructionist president. And the two years that he was able to pass legislation, he's passed formidable legislation that's tried to from the, the 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 pandemic acts to different equity orders to student loan reduction the inflation reduction act things connected to healthcare that's tried to bring about more citizenship and dignity for all in a very dysfunctional political environment where there's no way to pass great society legislation right. you have to pass stuff through through um um uh, reconciliation in the senate right and certainly um, if if build back the better, Democrat, if the original concept of build back better, yes. it, yeah, you know, whether it was the three point three point five trillion dollar version or or the original five trillion dollar version of build back better would not have been revolutionary, but it certainly could be seen, I think, as transformative in absolutely. the same way that the legislation from uh, the the 60s was and absolutely and, and, even and, and remember we were two senators away from that what people kind right. of don't understand we, we, if, if you have you know you know Kirsten Cinema Joe Manchin if you have two yeses not only do you get that and probably the, the the you know the 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 big version of that but you also get the For the People Act, with the, which expands voting rights. You get the John R. Lewis Act, which restores voting rights. You get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So, I mean, you really do change um, the, the country. And I'm, I'm, I'm sad that that didn't happen, obviously. Yeah. But 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 the, we, we were very, very close. And I still think the Reconstructionist sentiments of Biden, I mean, he's appointed more Black women to the federal bench in, in, in American history. He's tried to do a whole, whole lot. And just even the rhetoric, I think one of the things we're caught up in the Third Reconstruction, which is why you see the attacks on the 1619 Project, the attacks on Ibram Kendi, who's a friend of mine, one of my mentees, I've known even for 15 years, the, the attacks on how to be an anti-racist or how to be a young anti-racist. All these absurd things is because by 2020, Reconstructionists during this third Reconstruction were decisively winning the narrative war. That's why you had the National Football League say Black Lives Matter, right. despite banning Colin Kaepernick, all these different things. And there was a real fear that if, if Reconstructionists got the federal apparatus, which they did, but not with the complete might that they might have, they were they were gonna they were gonna embed and institutionalize those gains that they made. You know, during for a time in 2020, Black Lives Matter 
um, has has um, majority positive opinion when you look at the program, right. right? Right. You know what I mean? And that's what's so important. One thing I'll say is that all of this comes down to stories and storytelling. And, and I think you learn this both in African traditions, but Jewish traditions too, why oral history is so, so important. Because oral histories, the stories we tell ourselves about the families we created and how they fit in the world are about the present and the future and not just the past. The reason why stories are so important is this, if you could tell yourself a positive story about immigration and diaspora, you could tell yourself a positive story about the working class and people who are poor and queer and marginalized. If you do that, you're gonna build up monuments to those people and policies and legislation that allow those people to flourish. You can also tell a negative story about them. You can tell this negative story about how they're going to ruin all of us and they're here to do bad things to you and you build up monuments to people who've tried to oppress those people and you're gonna have different outcomes. So the reason why there's such a battle over the 1619 Project versus uh, 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 you know, the 1776 commission, uh, anti-critical race theory is that every, the, 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 com the, the combatants realize that the stories we are telling about the past are not about the past. That's what's so important. Right. The reason why we, I'm somebody who, who, like I said, I, I, I believe in multiracial democracy and I see the convergences with blacks and Jews. When we think positive convergences, the reason why we have to tell the story of the Holocaust and six million Jews being murdered, um, excuse me, my dog, I just got no worries. <laughs> delivery. The reason why we have to tell that story, hey, honey, can you stop, Foxy? Don't worry about it. It's uh... the dog is just going. It's okay. We can't hear it. <laughs> So the reason why we have to tell that story, when we think about the Holocaust, and and um, you know, Clint Smith has a great piece in the Atlantic now about visiting you know memorials in Germany. The reason why we have to tell that story is it's not just about the past; it's about the present and the future, and how we treat Jewish people, and how we how we come to terms with anti-Semitism in the present and the future. That's why. Right? right. So it's never just about the past. It's about now because the way in which the stories we tell about the past impact the present and the future is always, always what we're in the arena for. So what I think is so interesting about this period is that for the first time in American history, more people know about aspects of our shared past than ever before. And you have a whole class of redemptionists who are trying to make that illegal and have succeeded in right. state. And and um, you've got a Supreme Court 6-3 redemptionist court that is behind them as well. That's one of the fascinating things. But it shows the battle over critical race theory, the battle over the flag. All this shows how important stories are. And it's the story of us, right? Some people were angry at the Super Bowl that there's a Black national anthem sang alongside a white national anthem. The Black anthem by James Weldon Johnson is about America and American democracy, but it's also telling us about the dark night that Black people have faced despite serving the country. It's important to understand why that story is, is present and needs to continue to be told in our own time. Right? I, That's I, saw, I saw so a tweet, uh, someone said, can you imagine the outrage if uh, we had played a, a white national anthem? And if you read the verses that are left out that we sing now, you realize we did. We do. We do that every time uh, we sing uh, the, the national anthem. It is literally there is a, a paragraph or two uh, from the, the the anthem that is is dropped now, but it was part of the essence of yeah. the story that was being told. So literally, it's like if you try and run away as a slave, we're going to come after you and kill right. you. Absolutely. And that's uh, I, that's not that's a paraphrase. Yeah. But um, yeah. all right. So let me ask you this, because. The if we were to have this conversation in the fall of 2020, I would have said BLM is, uh, you know, there's real reason to believe that the, the BLM movement is going to be successful in terms of 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 reform. Yeah. If we had had this conversation maybe in, uh, you know, January of 2021, I would have said like, whoa, or, 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 or maybe like right after the uh, American Rescue Act, I'd be like, Whoa, wait a second. We may be in the midst of some real yeah. massive policy changes. 
you know, the implications of having, uh, you know, um, uh, pre universal pre-K and, and uh, paid leave and parental leave. And uh, I mean, on and on and on, there was a lot of stuff in that yeah. first iteration yeah. of, of build back better. We didn't get that. And no. uh, got some and, stuff in the inflation reduction act. So I, yes, I, I, there, there, I mean, there's between, some. between the American rescue plan, which did the child tax credits and was giving people money in the inflation reduction plan. Um, they got the chip act done. There's um, good, there's good things in there, yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, in terms of like extending the, the earned, uh, the, the child tax credit, I mean, yeah. we, we, we could, we could quibble as to whether it reaches some threshold of transformative yeah. or not, but, but the bottom line, it's certainly in terms of like, um, uh, uh, criminal justice reform, there has not been that much. No. So, no. but it, but one of the things the, the, do we know and, and we do, we can't know if like uh, who knows what 2024 brings maybe we're in a position where there is uh, we can yeah. do a policy you know uh, probably going to lose the senate in terms of the democrat but but one never knows yeah they said but, we were going to lose the house by 40 something seats and they lost by seven and, and they said the senate was going to be lost and they gained one indeed so, so yeah. but but what about the the narrative is there a way for us to assess right now or is mm -hmm. it too early to, to make the proclamation that we can, like the redemptionists won the first reconstruction, the reconstructionists won the narrative for the second reconstruction. Yeah. Are we at a place where we can make that assessment about the third reconstruction or is it just, we're, we're just in the middle of it too much? Yeah, we're too, it's too early to call. It's too early to call because it's like you said, if you had called this in 2020 as a race, reconstructionists win hands, hands down. Now the, the last two years, you would say redemptionists and a few years before, when Trump was in there, you'd say redemptionist as well. But then when Obama was there, starting in 08, 09, you'd say reconstructionist. So I think you've seen dizzying juxtapositions here, and you really just can't tell. And I think, obviously, elections really, really matter. You know, Supreme Courts really, really matter. So I think 2024, 2026, a second Biden term um, gives you hope for four more years and, and creating a kind of political stability where you can try to re-marginalize redemptionists. I don't think you're ever gonna be able to extinguish that, but they can be on the margins. And there's been times they've been in the political wilderness, right? The people who are Trump, DeSantis, and everything that that represents. Um, but we'll have to see. I think it's too, too early um, to call. One thing I will say, irrespective of what happens with elections, you know, we know from the data, Sam, with the millions of books that have been sold since 2020 and the numbers who are reading and teaching the 1619 Project, How to Be an Anti-Racist, you know, White Fragility, whatever books you want to talk about, that there is a groundswell of educators and just average Americans who are interested in this history in an empirical way at a rate that we've just never seen before. Right. And that gives me hope. And, and when I say at a rate, I mean by multiples, exponential, that we have, we've just never seen so many people who want to read about this history. And so many educators, teachers, and not just black teachers, but white teachers and Hispanic and Asian teachers wanting to teach this history. So that gives me hope because in these earlier iterations of reconstruction, that didn't happen. Even though 110 million people saw Roots, January right. 1977, ABC, and I was less than five when Roots came out, ABC was so afraid that they had a flop on their hands, they put it over eight consecutive nights and it became the highest rated miniseries in American history. And so that's how Roots ha happens, right? And so, so those folks then all then try to take black studies courses or teach kids and stuff, but we have so many different people, you know, how to be an anti-racist, um, between the world and me, Ta-Nehisi Coast, these books have sold millions. 1619 Project not only has it sold millions, it's got um, tens of thousands of educators who are trying to teach it where they can. And some in a fugitive way are even teaching it where legally they can't teach it at school, but they're setting up freedom schools with organizations like Teaching for Change and other grassroots organizations. So that should give us hope where we can't just always look at the top in the elections. We have to look at what are people doing at the at the grassroots to impact that narrative war. Do you perceive the growing you know, and certainly relative to like the, the both, and I, I think these are, uh, are, are, um, are, are related, 
the idea that we have a generation that is not going to do better than their parents for the first time and, and, and almost successful successive now generations but uh and the growing sort of um uh i guess um amenableness to socialism uh yeah. economic democracy essentially yeah. Yeah. um do you see that as also part of a uh, an indication that that perhaps this is you know that that this narrative will ex succeed i guess or or be durable for a period of time and maybe bring some type of of a result well yeah you know i like that you asked that question sam because i think the social democracy question is key young voters 18 to 29 who are the only voters who voted over 50 percent for democrats in the 2022 midterms much more amenable to social democracy and 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 they they want both of those things and when we think about social democracy uh martin luther king jr was a social democrat what he wanted was an expansive democracy that had a basic guaranteed floor of universal health care uh universal education um universal housing uh and we all need universal um transportation so you know th those are basically the four things that he wanted guaranteed uh, for all people. And yes, we have elections. And yes, you have a system of capitalism, but it's a system of capitalism that doesn't have these huge um, inequities and inequalities that we have. That's the whole thing. So you're still going to have uh, gaps between the rich and the poor, but you're not going to have the Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos gaps uh, in, in, in that system because we're protecting so many different people and we'll protect the environment and will protect human beings and 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 communities in ways that are much more beneficial than what we're doing now. And I think absolutely younger voters by need are aware of our need for social right. democracy because like you said they're successively, you know, most of them except who are connected to elites are not going to be doing as well as their 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 parents on average. And like right now, I live in Austin, I mean, you know, housing prices in central Austin, I mean, it's like a million dollars. I mean, how how can you how can you um, afford that? How can you how can you say, hey, yeah, I'm going to buy a house, and your 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 child's going to buy a house, and your grandkids are going to have if you're not if you don't have tens of millions of dollars in wealth. So I think by necessity, we're going to see a lot more of that. It's going to be interesting because that group's going to be the largest voters um demographically by 2028 and we're gonna it's gonna be interesting to see what kind of president that group wants um in another six years